G'day everyone, and welcome to the second video in week one of our Legal Ethics and Trust Accounting course. In the first video this week, we looked at what it means to say that the law is a profession. We looked in particular at the fact that being a profession means submitting to professional discipline and having it adhering to professional ethics. In this second video, we're going to ask what exactly we mean by ethics. I mean, ethics is a word that we've all heard many times in our lives, but it might well be that you've never actually stopped to think about what the word actually means. At its simplest, ethics refers to the question of how a person ought to behave. Ethics asks about people's character and their morality. It asks what it means to be a good person. And it asks why we would want to be a good person anyway. The study of ethics, which was also historically called the study of moral philosophy, goes back thousands of years. One of the earliest serious works we have is by the philosopher Aristotle, who wrote a book called the Nicomachean Ethics, where he proposed that the way to happiness and a good life was through being a person of virtue, a person of excellent character. Since Aristotle, literally dozens of serious philosophers have kicked around the question of how a person ought to live. I'm not going to go through all that formal classical ethics with you. Personally, I find it fascinating. And if you're interested, I genuinely encourage you to read more. But it goes a bit beyond what you need for this course. For this course, I'm going to adopt the approach taken to ethics by the Ethics Centre of Australia, previously known as the St James Ethics Centre. These are people who seriously study ethics, not from a theoretical or a philosophical perspective, but from the perspective of asking how real people ought to make real decisions in a complex ethical environment when the right decision or the right thing to do might not be at all clear. Their model of ethics is based on three dimensions, values, principles and purpose. Our values are like the guiding stars of our lives. They tell us as individuals what we believe are the things worth striving for, worth protecting, worth enhancing. The thing is, these values are individual. For some people, the highest value might be family. For some people, it might be freedom. For some people, it might be gluttony and wealth. For some people, it might be sexual pleasure. For some people, it might be friendship. For some people, it might be national duty, or God and religion, or the protection of animals, or the joy of dance or music. Every single individual person will have their own unique set of values. However, those values are highly determined by culture. In some cultures, religion is prized as such a value that people will think nothing of making massive sacrifices for their religion and their God. In some societies, freedom is the highest value. In some societies, it's national loyalty. People in those societies still have the opportunity to develop their own values, but they're pretty likely to be influenced by the people around them. If you grow up in Iran, you're more likely to consider religion to be the highest value. If you grow up in the USA, you're more likely to consider liberty to be the highest value. If you grow up in Norway, it's more likely to be community. The more that people share values, the more they're likely to find consensus on ethical principles and how people should act. The more they differ in those values, the more likely they are to differ on questions of ethical principles and how people should act. An American would be utterly puzzled by a person who didn't value liberty and possibly consider them to be evil while an Iranian might well be utterly puzzled by someone who didn't place religion at the heart of their every day and possibly consider them to be evil. Values, it turns out, are fundamental. The second element of ethics according to the Ethics Centre is principles. Principles are a bit less airy-fairy than values. Principles tell you the sorts of things that you may or may not do in pursuit of your values. People who share the same values might not share the same principles. For instance, let's consider a gun owner in Australia and a gun owner in the United States. Both of them might value freedom, at least as far as the freedom to own firearms. 
The Australian, however, might accept that this freedom can only be exercised in a way that protects the community from future Port Arthur massacres. And so the Australian accepts the principle that gun ownership should be regulated in a way that preserves the freedom to own and use firearms, but limits that freedom in a way that is necessary for the community to be safe. The American, however, might say that the value of freedom to own firearms cannot ever be limited in any way at all without being destroyed. For the American, the value of freedom to own firearms is the way of protecting the community, and so any limitations on that freedom make the community less safe. Now, you might have your own opinions on this topic. I sure do. But we can see that the American and the Australian have the same values here. And they implement those values according to different principles. And so they make very different ethical decisions. These ethics and principles add up to the third element, purpose. Purpose asks, what is your reason for being? As human beings, we have the unique ability to choose what our purpose is. And our purpose, our individual aims and purpose, will be utterly bound up in our values and the principles by which we implement those values. So for me, I value knowledge. One of my strongest values as a person is the notion that knowledge is wonderful. It's amazing. And one of the principles supporting that, for me personally, is that knowledge does its best work when it's spread around to everyone, not just limited to a few. And so my purpose is to teach, to learn more myself, and to teach other people the things that I know, so that they can take that knowledge and add to it themselves. So more knowledge is created, and I believe this will make the world a better world. See how it works? Now we get to the tricky bit. How do you take all of this and apply it in the real world? How do you make everyday decisions that support your values in a manner consistent with and guided by your principles and which help you achieve your purpose? That is a tough question. A bloody tough question. Anyone who offers you an easy answer is fooling you. The Ethics Centre doesn't offer answers. They offer more questions, things you might think about. They say you should ask, would I be happy for this decision to be headlining the news tomorrow? Is there an ethical non-negotiable at play, some ethic so strong that you must support it, come what may, at any price? Will my action make the world a better place? What would happen if everyone took the same decision that I'm taking? What will my next action do to my character or the character of my organisation? Will it make me or us better or worse? Can you see that the whole approach to ethics is completely different to having a set of rules? Rules are comfortable. They're essentially black and white. If the light is green, you go. If the light is red, you stop. Ethics don't provide such certainty. Think about a driver on the road. Rules would say the speed limit here is 60. If you're doing exactly 60 kilometres an hour, then as far as the rules are concerned, you're going at a safe speed. But if you go 60.1 kilometres an hour, then the rules say that you're going too fast and driving unsafely. An ethical approach would say, what are your values? If you value safety, then think about the safe speed to be travelling on this road. Decide it for yourself. If you value rapid transportation, then think about the speed that's likely to get you to your destination quickest, remembering that if you have a crash, that might end up taking more time than a slower speed, and if it's a bad crash, you might not get there at all. But nobody's telling you what speed to go. Ethics are complicated and a little scary. Now you're doing this course because you're at least contemplating becoming a legal practitioner, either a solicitor or a barrister. Now each of those halves of the profession have already sat down and thought about a bunch of this stuff. Along with the courts and the government on behalf of the community, they've thought, what are the values of our profession? What are the principles that are going to guide the conduct of people in our profession? What are the purposes that we will permit those in our profession to have? And what purposes do we forbid? 
They've coalesced all of that into two sets of rules, the Australian Solicitor's Conduct Rules and the Bar Rules. Now, I hate the fact that these are called rules. In one sense, they are rules. We're going to spend a lot of time in this course looking at the rules, and if you breach them, even by a little bit, then you're going to end up in a world of hurt. But following the rules is not enough to make you an ethical practitioner. The world is too complicated. The law is too complicated. Legal practice is too complicated for any single set of rules. You have to follow the rules. But on top of that, you have to do everything you can to apply the spirit of those rules. You have to absorb the values of the profession and live them. This means a commitment to justice. It means a commitment to the court that's higher even than your own commitment to your clients. It means, however, still putting your clients' interests before your own. It means treating your opponents ethically even when they're not doing the same to you. It means doing everything in your power, not just to be a good lawyer, but everything you can to be a good person. When you are admitted, you swear an oath or make an affirmation in the Supreme Court that you will truly and honestly conduct yourself in the practice of a lawyer of this court. Truly and honestly. There's no rule that can teach you what it means to act truly and honestly. Instead, we have ethics. For the rest of this course, we'll be looking at some of the ethical rules, but none of those rules can replace your own ability as a human being with an education in the law, your own ability to make true and honest ethical decisions. That's it for video two, folks. In the third and final video this week, I'm going to show you the road ahead for this subject. We'll look at what's coming at you for the next 11 or 12 weeks and also what the assessment process is going to look like. On to video three.